picture of it. Okay, we're uh, we're good to go. Is everybody in? Uh, that's in there right now. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're, um, uh, we're good to go. So the, the we're live streaming, right? Okay. Yep. Let me just open the right. Page. Okay. So, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming to tonight's open seminar. Um, those of you who are late will be let in to join uh, at a later point by uh, Zach. So. Uh, for those of you who are following online, we are beginning. Uh, so uh, before I present uh, tonight's speaker and uh, say a little bit uh, about the topic of uh, his seminar uh, this evening, uh, I should also present the School of Materialist Research, so the host of this uh, seminar, of this event. Um, the School of Materialist Research, or SMR, is an education and research collective that offers intensive study courses, seminars, uh, so such as this one, open seminars and other special uh, programs, and research initiatives that address the materialisms running through contemporary science, philosophy, art, mathematics, design, architecture, and politics. SMR was founded by the Center for Philosophical Technologies at Arizona State University, the Institute of Social Sciences and Humanities from Skopje, the Department for Architecture, Theory and Philosophy of Technics at the Technical University of Vienna, the Critical Inquiry Lab at the Design Academy of Eindhoven, the Netherlands, and serves as a global hub for education, research, and experimentation at the intersection of the humanities, social sciences, creative fields, and the STEM sciences. So a little bit about Thomas. Uh, Thomas Neil is a professor of philosophy at the University of Denver and author of numerous books, including The Figure of the Migrant, Theory of the Border, uh, no, 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 that's the same book, right? Uh, Marx in Motion, uh, a book that I'm currently finishing reading. It's a great book, by the way. Uh, and the one on the earth, uh, Theory of the Image, Theory of the Object, Theory of the Earth, also a great book. Lucretius 1, 2, and 3, Returning to Revolution and Being and Motion. His research focuses on the philosophy of movement. Neil is interested in developing uh, a philosophy of movement. His work combines the insights of process philosophy and new materialism to develop a unique kinetic philosophy. His methodology is motivated by pressing contemporary concerns and deeply rooted in historical and empirical research. Um, the, uh, the philosophy of movement, a little bit about tonight's uh, talk. So uh, the main question that Thomas will ask or tr and try to respond uh, tonight are, why have matter and movement posed such enormous difficulties for philosophers and scientists in the Western tradition? Uh, is the movement of nature continuous or discrete? And why have the greatest minds of Western civilization dedicated their lives to discovering something truly immobile? Aristotle's idea of an unmoved mover, Archimedes' fixed point, Descartes' unmovable certainty, Newton's uh, dive cloak uh, a clockmaker, and even Einstein's idea of a block universe are all part of this grand effort. But what motivated this important pursuit and what are the consequences of it for materialism today? This talk provides an introduction to the philosophy of movement and process materialist philosophy. Uh, I'm sorry I 
became so identified with what I was reading, almost as if acting, but I agree with the way these questions are asked. I strongly agree. So therefore, uh, my theatrical background uh, came to the front. Um, okay, now I give the floor to uh, Thomas. Thank you, Katerina, and uh, thanks to, to Zach and Risto and everybody that's organizing the SMR. It's such an awesome effort, but it takes a lot of effort, and I really appreciate the amount of work that you're putting into it. Um, it can be really exhausting. Um, so anyway, thanks for having me, and thanks for everybody that's that's coming today to, to listen to the to the live stream. It's very cool. Um, so uh, Katerina asked me to, to kind of give a general, um, you know, maybe an informal sort of introduction. I mean, those are big questions. I... I also agree with those questions. I'm glad that you do too. And, but I can't answer them all right now. So I, I hate to disappoint. I'll just tell you, I won't be able to answer all of that right now. It's taken me about a decade just to kind of get the beginnings of an answer to those questions. Um, but I'd like to just sort of introduce where I'm coming from, uh, wh where the philosophy of movement is coming from, how I came to this. Um, and that might give you a sense of just, yeah, I guess just where I'm coming from and, and how I've come to start this research program and, and, and keep it going for almost a decade um, and where I'm at now with it um, and, and maybe some future directions. So just kind of biographically, I'll say that I, I got into philosophy, um, I guess as a, when I was young, I was into punk rock music and um, it was very political music. And I got exposed to political theory by listening to a lot of punk music and um, trying to figure out what the hell they were talking about, uh, you know, when I was 16. And that got me into political activism and reading people like Noam Chomsky and then eventually into kind of more anarchist political theory. Um, and then when I went to undergraduate, I was my first big sort of philosophical love was uh, was anarchist theory and ecofeminism. And to me, I really I was sort of drawn to them as really nice syntheses that sort of brought together a long tradition of critical theory that was just trying to see a synthetic view of a, of a history of hierarchical thinking and, and societies. Um, and anyway, that's where I was coming from. And then I moved to Eugene, Oregon, where I went to the University of Oregon to do um, my PhD there. Um, I was interested in sort of feminist philosophy and environmental philosophy when I arrived. And everybody there was a phenomenologist. Um, and so I did a long kind of training in phenomenology. And that's where I came from. And then at a certain point, I was sort of, I don't know, disenchanted with the anthropocentrism that I felt was kind of endemic to phenomenology. Um, and that led me to Deleuze. And that's when I think my, my professors just kind of, my phenomenologist professors sort of lost me there. They're like, oh, Deleuze, I don't know. I don't know if that's the right way for you to go, but that's where I ended up going is just trying to figure out anti-Oedipus because it was the craziest thing I had ever read at that time. And just trying to make sense of it took me the rest of my graduate education to figure it out. Um, and so at the end of graduate school, I went to, uh, I did a Fulbright scholarship to Toronto and Montreal in Canada to work with this migrant justice group called No One Is Illegal. Um, I was really fascinated by my, uh, migration, political philosophy of migration, partly just because a lot of liberal theorists uh, and a lot of political philosophy at the time. So this is like 2009, 2008. There really wasn't a large literature on the political philosophy of migration. It wasn't something that uh, a lot of political theorists was talking. Well, I mean, right now that sounds outrageous to even think, but I mean, if you recall back, I mean, there really wasn't much of a literature. A lot more has come out since post 2010. So anyway, I went there for a year to work with this group, which was a really wonderful experience filled with super, very different than the activist work I've been doing in Eugene, which was about kind of environmental activism. Um, a lot of sort of white anarchists in Eugene uh, and then moving to Toronto was very different. Um, and in, a, in the best possible way. Um, and it was a very, it's a very, no one is illegal if you don't know anything about them. They're a, they're a relatively anarchist oriented kind of migrant justice movement. Um, and they're, they're quite big. I mean, in, a, in the US, it's not nearly as, as radical, I would say. Um, and places like Canada and Germany, France and the UK, no one is illegal is a lot bigger. And we don't really have a big no one is illegal movement. In any case, that's where I spent a year thinking about migration and sort of trying to deal with the problem of why aren't political philosophers thinking migration is really important. Rawls just says, oh yeah, well, you know, in the ideal society, nobody would wanna leave or go anywhere. So migration borders, it's not really a central political issue. And I just, that's outrageous. I mean, yeah, I mean, everybody loves to beat on Rawls uh, on that issue, but I was certainly, that certainly was emblematic for me. 
So I spent the year thinking about migration and doing activist work there um, and thinking a lot more about movement. Um, because I was reading a, a body of literature, because a lot of literature on migration is not in philosophy, it's in sociology and everywhere else. There's a really big discipline called mobility studies that's just kind of all over the place, thinking about all different types of mobility, uh, transportation, migration, uh, global capitalism, all kinds of things. And so I ended up reading a lot uh, more of political theory, uh, political, I don't know, sociology or maybe political informed things that aren't, weren't necessarily philosophical or theoretical. And thinking a lot more about what a theoretical framework would look like to think about motion and movement that was so central to migration and why mobility scholars didn't really, they weren't really doing much philosophical work for the most part. There were some exceptions for sure. And then on the way back, actually, uh, so I was thinking a lot about movement, about migration, trying to think about the history of migration. And then on the way back, something very dramatic happened to me as my wife and I were driving back from Canada to the West Coast. Um, we got back and started packing up things to move and I, I got vertigo really, really bad. And I don't, I just out of nowhere, just everything was spinning for days. Um, and I went to the doctor eventually when I could, and he told me it was some kind of virus that had basically damaged my inner ear. Um, and the, the, the range of the, it could be permanent, it could be temporary, but it ended up causing sort of lasting damage to my, to my inner ear. And so I like, had this really intense vertigo experience, which intensified for me thinking more about movement and motion and how important that is um, uh, both in our lives and politically. So I was thinking about movement at a bunch of different scales. And then I was hired at the University of Denver. Um, and that's when I was sort of putting together all of the research for the figure of the migrant book. Um, and when I started researching and putting it all together and writing the book, I was just, it was historical for me. I mean, I have this kind of Foucauldian background, so it was very historical. The way that I was proceeding was I, a lot of the migration literature was just 19th century forward, like great migration to, to the present. And to me, I wanted something sort of deeper than that to go historically deeper and conceptually deeper and what had been done so far. And that led me to thinking, because it's not like there's a discourse about migration explicitly. It's like, that's largely a demographic uh, kind of, terminology and a kind of investment that happened, you know, maybe beginning 18th century, 19th century, you have demography and statistics thinking about migrants. Um, but before that, you have all kinds of other discourses that are about different, what would we, we would now call migratory groups, but at the time were not called migrants. So anyway, tracing that history back, I started reading Aristotle, you know, and for me, one of the pivotal moments, like just aha moments came where Aristotle is, I was reading the politics alongside uh, the physics and thinking about Aristotle's absolute, just really dismissal and hatred of barbarians. Um, and one of the reasons he gives of why barbarians are so inferior and that citizens are so superior is that the citizens in the polis stay there um, and they don't, they don't move around. And nomads and barbarians move around all the time and that destabilizes them. So they're not able to create a proper city with proper politics. So they're fundamentally apolitical people and they don't have access because they don't speak, they don't speak Greek, they don't have philosophical language. Um, and so they're sort of deprived of philosophy, deprived of politics and, uh, uh, you know, in a way that's tied to this importance of, of stasis. And in the metaphysic or in the end of the physics, I should say in book eight, Aristotle says, the unmoved mover. Right. The, yeah, the whole book physics is filled with all. I mean, well, Aristotle is a wonderful theory of movement, but in the end, he can't he can't handle the idea that movement just that matter just moves and changes. It's got to be originally directed, and you have to have this system of first and final causes. Um, and that sort of that to me is an indication. Um, it sort of guides and is consistent with his political theory. So then it sort of got me thinking about, well, what have other philosophers said and what was going on politically at the time and sort of trying to match up the political with the cosmological or ontological description. And then I started seeing these regularities and the descriptions and a fetishization of stasis um, that, was, that was consistent. Um, and that sort of led me to see that the project about migration was not just about the history of migration, but that if you go deeper, it's a philosophical project that Western history and philosophy and science has really been dedicated to for a long time, which is always trying to explain motion and matter by something else. It's never acceptable to just say that matter moves. We've got to have an explanation, some kind of metaphysical answer of why that's happening. And you get all kind, and it was interesting to study the typology of how that worked. 
Um, and so that led after the political books, the figure, the migrant and the theory of the border, it led me to kind of the, to, to look at the philosophical history. Um, and so that interest was sort of born from a kind of post Deleuzean world in which you have in 2008 and 2009, a lot of kind of, you know, some of my favorite Deleuzean feminists, Donna Haraway, uh, Rosie Brodotti, um, uh, Elizabeth Gross, Claire Colebrook, they started getting into materialism and thinking more about uh, and calling it feminist materialism. And that interested me from that perspective. It seemed like the way to go after Deleuze was to, to take him in this feminist materialist direction. So that was a partly the theoretical background and partly there's a kind of activist political background mixed with like that mobilities literature and sociology. Um, and all of those coming together produced in me a kind of, I don't know what to me, what felt like a unique response, which was what's up with movement anyway? Like nobody's investigated this. And I looked for books on the history of movement, like what people thought about movement. There's no book, doesn't exist. What did philosophers, is there a book that covers the history of the philosophy of movement? No, there's not. And I found that weird that that didn't exist. And so I wanted to make it exist. Um, and I wanted to track that story down. And that's what I did. That's what being in movement uh, or being in motion, that book was about, was basically writing the first history of the philosophy of movement. What a philosopher said overlaps, you know, to some degree with some religious uh, scholars that we would call religious, whatever. And then scientists, people we call scientists. who. But what philosophy was at the time was, of course, all of those things. In any case, that's the history that I started tracking down. Um, and that project emerged out of a series of courses that I was trying to teach because, again, I mean, we've got books on like the philosophy of time, the philosophy of space, the philosophy of force. I could find books on the history of all those things, but nothing on the philosophy of movement. There were some partial ones that covered bits of history, but not a large history uh, of the West. So I started teaching this class that I called the philosophy of movement in order just to see like, what did philosophers say about movement? Um, uh, since there wasn't really a systematic book that I could use, I just um, started teaching a bunch of philosophers that I thought might talk about movement. And it turns out that pretty much every philosopher talks about movement. Um, and so there's a lot to work with. And that was a really big project that led me way outside my, uh, my normal range of contemporary French political theory to start looking really broadly at uh, what philosophers and scientists had said. And I taught this class for several years and it was really enlightening. And a couple results that I'll share with you about this class that I thought that to me were just, I learned something out of teaching everybody and only looking at what they said about movement and trying to piece that together. Because I thought there might be some philosophers that were, um, that, that, that might say and admit that, well, there's just matter and it moves and there's no higher explanation than that. And we'll just be okay with that. And that's the basis of how we're gonna do philosophy. I thought, well, surely there's gonna be some people who for movement that is, that is primary for them. And, um, and I had some hunches about who that was. So I put them into the syllabus and we read them. And those people were Deleuze, I thought was gonna be that. Cause that's, I mean, Deleuze does talk quite a bit about motion. Uh, Bergson, I thought for sure. Uh, Whitehead was another one. You know, the process philosophers, I thought there I'm gonna find this real sort of engagement with movement. Um, and I put in some other people that, I didn't, that was, were related but I wasn't totally sure. Um, and that was, uh, and those are the, like, it wasn't the people that I thought it was going to be in the end. And I, I know I'm just saying this right now and I can't prove it to you. You have, you have to read the chapter with all the citations. So I'm just going to say the results of my personal conclusions of after teaching this was that Deleuze is not a philosopher of movement. Um, he does get very close. He is certainly a process philosopher, but he's not. And we can talk about that. And especially in the Q and A, if I don't answer it to your satisfaction, we can talk about it. Um, Whitehead isn't either, and neither was Bergson. Bergson was my last hold that I thought for sure, um, but really in the end, it's his vitalism that really, that really for me is still an attempt to explain movement by something else. Um, I don't really see the need for that vital power, but Bergson very much does. It's deeply part of his philosophy. And so anyway, those were, I, I was kind of disappointed, but I was very surprised to find that the people that I didn't think, or that I had really no idea much about what they thought about movement, were, did just accept that matter moved and without any higher explanation. And the first in that series was Lucretius. I thought, oh, I, you know, I'd read Michel Serre's book on the swerve and it was connected with Deleuze's or writings about Lucretius. I thought, oh, wow, Lucretius, you know, he's, he's somebody who, who that swerve, that swerve has got to be important somehow. Um, 
And ultimately it kind of led me down this Lucretius rabbit hole of writing three books about it, just kind of close reading that De Rare Natura. But you know, it's uh, that, that swerve to me, I realize now, and this is just where I'm at right now, which is that the swerve to me is the most important philosophical idea in the Western tradition. Important because I feel like, not because no one's heard of it, not because everybody uses it, but because nobody has, I think, or very few people have like been able to affirm that in its full, in the way that Lucretius intended, which is that there's no higher explanation of the swerve, that matter swerves indeterminately without any external cause and without any higher metaphysical explanation. And Lucretius makes no attempt to give one. And that's a pretty, that's a pretty big thing to have to admit. I mean, because the reception of that story is like, you know, Plutarch, Cicero, and everybody afterwards is like, there's some cool stuff in Lucretius, but that swerve idea, that's bonkers. Nothing just swerves without a cause, okay? That's crazy. Um, there needs to be a cause, and it could be God or the soul or freedom or the mind and rational will or any kind of thing you want to throw out there. There's got to be forces and so on. And since we're on the topic, I'll just say that this was like where the limits of my Deleuze world started to like unravel at this moment in where I tracked that actually I, I didn't track it down, but um, Keith Ansel Pearson tracked it down and told me about it. And I was like, oh my God, that makes so much sense to me now. And he told me there's this footnote in uh, Deleuze's book on Nietzsche and philosophy where Deleuze says, because you know Deleuze had read two really important texts, Lucretius, and he had read Marx's dissertation about Lucretius and Epicurus. And one of the very few people early on to read that text and take it seriously and understood what and understand what it meant, which is that Marx had the most bonkers heterodox interpretation of Lucretius that anybody had seen. There's nobody like that. Marx was like, oh no, there's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's atoms, but because they're always swerving and because they're always moving, he says that the atom totally disappears in the movement. And so there's really not any atoms at all. There's just a flow. There's a process. So Marx had this process interpretation of matter um, in his dissertation. And Deleuze is like, oh, yeah, there we go. Marx understood that. This is great. But, and this is the big but, Deleuze says, Lucretius, um, he has this swerve. And, Luke, and that's the thing. Deleuze is like, yes, we love this idea that the swerve just swerves without any external causality. But then Deleuze says, he says that, that, that the swerve of matter is only a mask for an incipient dynamism. And then he says, of force, of life. And that's where Nietzsche one-ups Marx and one-ups Lucretius. It's because for Nietzsche, it's all about forces, according to Deleuze. And there is a kind of vitalism in, in Nietzsche's later work. Early work, there's not, but later work, there absolutely is. And that's where Deleuze goes with it. He abandons Marx and he abandons Lucretius on this point. He cannot accept that the swerve is just fully material. He's got to say that it's like vital. There's a vital energy. And that's he's sort of drawing on the, and he, he even calls it in a uh, logic of sense toward the end, uh, Deleuze says, for Lucretius, it's, it's the swerve is conatus. Uh, that's very clever, but it's not right. It's, it's not in the text. Lucretius never uses the word conatus. It's just not there. I mean, it's a classic Deleuze move where he's just going to like throw Spinoza into something where Spinoza was not. Um, Lucretius was in Spinoza. Spinoza got all of his materialism from Lucretius, but he left out something very important. And that was the swerve. There is no swerve in Spinoza. Um, and there, and you, and there is, and it's the, the agency of the expression of things is through this conatus, this striving, this Spinoza, to be fair, doesn't call it a vital energy, but that's Deleuze kind of reading and wrapping up Bergson and Spinoza into a kind of vitalist process philosophy. In any case, the big conclusions to after teaching this, I was like trying to figure out who had, who had really affirmed just matter moving without any ex higher explanation. And that was Lucretius and then Marx. Um, and then really caught me by surprise after teaching the class for several years, uh, Virginia Woolf. And I hadn't really thought about Wolf. Like she was not really in the early, my first guesses, my second guesses, my third guesses. But Virginia Woolf actually just, she learned Latin by reading De Rerum, Lat De Rerum Natura. And I got a hold of her copy. I sent one of my research assistants to the, to the archives of, of Wolf's library in, um, in Washington state and uh, scanned the whole thing. And it's just marked up with all of her translations and commentary of Lucretius. And it deeply affected her is specifically the moments where Lucretius is having these kind of 
ecstatic moments where the world is unraveling before him and he's shaking in awe at how everything is kind of swerving and he's part of it all. In any case, those were some of her favorite moments. And the swerve influences her whole idea of in her essay on modern fiction. There's a million things to say about Wolf that I can't defend here, but I'm just going to say, I promise, and I've written a book on it now, but it's not out yet, but she was deeply influenced by Lucretius and it affects her whole her whole thinking about uh, 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 her very weird kind of materialism. She's not a straightforward materialist. Um, and I think the scholars have gone back and forth and no, nobody's been able to make sense of her weird materialism until new materialism, I think. I, I would argue that she is really, and when now you read feminist new materialists, they're like, oh yeah, Virginia Woolf. She is the most frequent, I tracked it down. I swear, I've, I've, I've tracked the number of citations she, Virginia Woolf is the most frequently cited, single, single most frequently cited feminine, early like proto new materialist feminist philosopher. Um, that was another cue to me that she was going to be worth spending a lot of time and writing a book on. Okay, I've gone on for a while. That's, that's where I'm from. That's where I have, have, that's how I was getting into this was trying to figure out who was thinking about movement and in, and, and in some ways trying to generate my own conceptual synthesis um, by the people who, for me, have had started this tradition and have been keeping it and had kept it going, which was Marx, uh, Lucretius, and Wolf, and then trying to extract from them and synthesize some more general concepts that um, that we could use elsewhere. Um, the other really big project that was like a series of books. The other series of books that I was working on at the same time that Katerina so so nicely enumerated all those books, but like all of those books were the kind of more historical approach in ontology, science, art, politics, uh, and then the last most recent one on nature. Um, all of those together, I just did the same history and, and came to some different conclusions. Uh, and those were, and I did not expect to find these there, but that I was thinking about movement. Like, how is it that, you know, because the, the big question was like, well, if everything is in movement, and I know I'm just saying that right now, but 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 for me, one of the motivations to figure out if that was actually true, like, okay, fine, nobody's taken it seriously as a primary ontological starting point or whatever, um, because it's a it's the weirdest starting point at all, because it's not really a starting point in a certain sense. But anyway, I started looking at the science of like physics, thinking about quantum physics, thinking about, you know, just contemporary physics, where are people at in that field? Um and I mean, there, the scientific, like in physics, we don't have any evidence for anything that is static in the universe. There's no, we've never found anything like that. Everything moves at some level um, in the case of physics. And at the quantum level, this is the quantum level is what makes this deeply true. And it's what made Einstein wrong. It always feels good to say that Einstein was wrong about something, but he did. He called it his biggest blunder that he thought that the universe wasn't expanding. He said it was just this kind of block. And he was wrong about that because Hubble in 1926 uh, proved him wrong. And he proved that the universe was expanding. And that really changed deeply the cosmological vision. And then around the same time, quantum physics proved and showed that quantum fields never stop vibrating. Even at their lowest levels of what's called the quantum vacuum, there's no zero energy. There's always fluctuations of energy. And that's happening and will keep happening. And we have no evidence or indication that that's ever going to stop happening. So it's not like movement versus stasis. These aren't strictly metaphysical categories. They're just kind of historical categories. Like that's just where we're at. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe physics is wrong. Maybe we'll find something that's totally static. There's no reason to think that that will happen. But if it does, I, I'm screwed because I've based everything around this idea that everything's moving. Um, but I will change my mind. I, this can be wrong. It's not a metaphysical position in my eyes to think that everything is in motion. Um, if you can point to me something that is not moving, I, I will concede. I will concede that as a historical empirical point. But until then, I'm going to proceed as if the consequences uh, were that everything is in motion. And so one of the one of the for me, I, I don't know if this is where everybody's mind would have gone, but for me, I was thinking, well, what if we went back? If this is true, and everything is in everything's moving, then why is it that everybody has believed and really tried to explain everything according to stasis, like? how is it that that emerged as a motion? You know what I'm saying? Like if everything is moving, how is it that movement produced humans, which then go back and then make everything, explain everything by stasis? Like how is it that the explanations of stasis in all their varieties of eternity and natural laws and gods and souls, how is it that that became a functional explanation of the world? 
for so long if everything really is in movement? Like, shouldn't have people just looked around and seen that nothing is static? What led them to that? So this, so that occasioned a very large six volume historical project to figure out how is it that movement itself could develop into patterns that produced ways of thinking and living that looked like they had some kind of static feature to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, for think for example, like a whirlpool, like a whirlpool, you could, you could point to it be like, oh, there's a whirlpool. But I mean, there's not really a whirlpool there. I mean, there's just water that's circulating through in a pattern that looks kind of, in physics, they call it metastable. It just looks like a metastable thing looks very stable, but it's actually fueled by energy and energy is going out in a constant sort of loop. In any case, I can't, I can't possibly reproduce the vast history for you at this moment, um, but I would like to show you a diagram because I only recently realized, like after I, find, I started finding these patterns, um, and there's four patterns that sort of iterate through at least this version from prehistory through the line I trace through modern European history, four sort of patterns of movement uh, that I saw developing across disciplines of science, art, politics, whatever, it, the historical period itself kind of predominates, it sort of develops, um, invents, adds to the previous formations, four of these patterns. Uh, the first one, I'll just go through them quickly, even though uh, there's really a lot more to say about them, but one of them is centripetal, and that's the movement from the periphery towards some kind of central area. Um, that is, a, that is we can think historically in prehistory about the early beginnings of human, you know, not permanent settlement necessarily, but any form of regular settlement in which humans start to consolidate things into a place. And that's a centripetal movement of gathering all kinds of things into a central region. And then later on in history with the rise of ancient empires, you get once a center has accumulated quite a lot of stuff, there's the possibility that someone can take over that central grain tower or that centralization of power and then use it and make it turn it into a uh, weaponize it into an army and then radiate back out. So from the center to the periphery, which you have kings, uh, you have priests, centralizations of resources, of water, of cities, and so on. And then so that spreads out. And so then you get a very different social historical pattern and also epistemological and all the other things when you, when you have a centralization uh, and then it moves outward again. Um, and then after that period uh, is the, roughly the very long, what I would say like a long medieval period in which you have the sort of dissolution of empires and of a huge conflict uh, in, in Europe uh, between lots of fragmented um, uh, feudal structures that aren't sense. So they're maybe micro centralized, but they're much more decentralized and kind of in tension with one another. They're all claiming a kind of authority, religious authority, political authority, territorial authority, um, legal authority, whatever. And they're sort of in tension. And so I call that sort of tensional motion uh, as opposed to the centrifugal uh, moving outward. Um, and then finally, uh, the modern type of motion uh, is elastic, which is to say that it's no longer about kind of fixed because during the medieval period, law, the invention and distribution of law as a binding uh, force, the whole feudal system is driven by these kind of contractual modes of existence um, in the modern period becomes much more flexible where you're dealing with the rise of nations uh, and the mutability of markets and the rise of liberalism and capitalism. In any case, that's a very that's like the shortest sketch I've ever given of that. Um, but I did, but I realized very recently, I was like, well, why are these things connected and how are they connected? Um, and why these patterns? Why not other patterns? Um, and I realized fairly recently, um, and I can maybe only tell you without the full explanation in theory of the earth, that these patterns are actually material patterns, they're results of entropy, um, that they are the results of spreading out of, of energy cities themselves, human social structures, they're not just socially constructed out of nothing. They fall, they're, they're fractal, which is to say, and they spread out at a certain rate and a certain distribution. Uh, you know, a fractal, if you think like a fern or a tree, there's branches and then branches off the branches and branches off the branch, branches. So there's both a temporal and a spatial. When you look at cities, there's a really great book called Fractal Cities that just traces the emergence of cities in history and they spread out. So humans spread out um, in these very specific types of patterns at different rates that are fractal. There's more to the fractal dimensions, but I won't go into the mathematics. I'll just say that they're spreading out in that way. And these patterns, so if you think about a tree, 
So if you imagine how a tree works, the tree sort of, uh, there's a centripetal motion in which the tree gathers together um, at a center of the trunk. And then it sort of centralizes that for a while, right? That's the centralization, the centrifugal. And then it spreads out when it starts to branch. And then it produces branches at certain, you know, um, positions such to maximize and not overlap with each other or block each other's light. But the branches spread out in a kind of tension with one another in the same way that medieval towns and cities started to spread out at a certain pacing. And you can look at the geography and you can see that instead of being densely concentrated around ancient empires, there was a spreading out of kind of micro cities and little bergs. And then finally, you have the modern period and the rise of the suburb. And this is this kind of elastic motion that's similar to the, um, like the leaves, the flexible elastic leaves at the end of the tree. So in any case, this tree pattern that's called a dendrite is that is that's how all these forms of motion and patterns are sort of organized. Um, because that's how matter moves. It's the distribution of dark matter in the universe. It's the distribution of, of water. If you spill it on the floor, it will drain out in these kind of tendrils. Um, these branching patterns are very, very important. Okay. That is one of the big conclusions, the four of those concepts that help organize. And I see the material dissipation of, of energy and its cultural transformation as well. So that is to say the materiality of culture is related to the, the entropic structure. I and mean, you can see it if you think about it on a large enough historical scale. Okay, now here's, here's the meat of it. Uh, if, you're, if you're like me, you often just like, you're like, well, what's the, like, what is new? What are the core features here? What's the thing that makes the philosophy of movement, the philosophy of movement? Um, I'm gonna try to say what those are now. And there's not a lot, uh, they're big ideas, but they are only three. Um, so there's three ideas, three concepts. I would say this is what I've tried to generate. This is the kind of conceptual framework or core um, that differentiates what I'm doing from a number of other ways of doing philosophy of thinking about matter and thinking about movement. Uh, but two prefaces before I give you the three concepts. First one is, I just wanna be clear, these are not metaphysical categories. I'm not saying this is the case forever and all time. I'm saying just what we know historically, experimentally, this is where we're at. That there is, I, there's nothing that is not moving. Um, and that when I say matter and motion, I, I mean, I really have in mind the extent to which we understand that, which is the limits of quantum physics. We're talking about energy. Energy can turn into matter, which is more stable technically in the physics terminology. But I have in mind that energy in this sense is material the way that I mean it. Okay, energy fluctuates and it is indeterminate. And I know there's interpretations of quantum physics, but I'm, I'm giving you uh, mine slash Lucretius's slash Carlo Rovelli's. Um, that's, that's, which is a kind of like not an interpretation. It's like an agnostic version. All the other interpretations are metaphysical interpretations that physicists have multiple universes, collapse of wave function, um, all these other interpretations are uh, essentially assuming something that we don't really have any evidence for, but they do make the math work um, in a way that the math is deeply problematic. Okay, so uh, the second one is that the really big difference about movement is I think when we think about movement, we think about it kind of more classical mechanics. A particle goes from A to B. This is not how movement actually works. This is like a kind of functional instrumental way that we think about it to like get on with the world um, at, at a sort of macroscopic level. Um, but what's happening instead, and Bergson I think was right about this, it's just, there's just a, there's a, there's a well, he, well, he calls it a qualitative change of the whole, but there's just a transformation, a constant transformation of everything in the universe. That's what I mean by movement, not A to B, although of course also A to B, but like there just is no A. Um, a is a metastable process of which is constantly changing. So there's not technically the identity of A, nor technically an identity of B, nor technically a linear process from A to B at all. There's none of that. From a quantum perspective, from a Lucretian perspective, there's just a continuous swerving and transformation that produces metastable states that then look as if relative to our scale of time and space that they go from A to B. So part of that is general relativity, but it's important to add that quantum level that this is not just happening at the level of space time, but that at the quantum level, it is movement is the condition, it is, it is what produces space time itself. That's the other crazy idea uh, in, in physics, it's called quantum gravity. It's the holy grail of trying to merge quantum physics with general relativity is 
an explanation of how space-time itself emerges out of quantum fluctuations. Um, there's lots of theories. There's about 12 of them. Um, there's very little experimental evidence so far, but everybody, a lot of theoretical physicists are working on this. This is the big project. String theory is the most outrageous and unexperimentally verifiable theory of anything. Um, but there are some, Carl Robelli's, at least in principle, can be experimentally verified, even though it's not there yet. In any case, I do think that's an important insight. And also it's something Rovelli attributes directly to Lucretius, that Lucretius's idea of the swerve was the first idea of, of quantum indeterminacy. Okay, here's the three ideas without any, any further qualifications. The first one, uh, and these are just concepts I fully admit that I have like both invented and borrowed from the people that I have read. It's not like these are words that you've never heard before, but they mean something particular. The first one is flow. Reality at every scale, that's what these concepts are supposed to be dealing with. Um, we can think about them or it's helpful or it does something to think about them in this way. The first ones are is flow. A flow for me is something that is, it is the Lucretian swerve. It is indeterminate. It is a process as a process. It's not being, it's not non-being. It's a process of becoming, but plus entropy. Um, if you will. So it's not just some metaphysical idea of becoming. I, it is a material process of change that is structured in our universe. So this is not a historical or a spatial. It is our region of the universe as we know it in this moment is that what we know about things is they are spreading out and they are constantly changing and moving. So that's what I mean by flow is just the spreading out of energy as it changes and swerves in the universe. Now, Obviously, it doesn't just change and spread in some general way. What happens is energy responds to itself. Um, and this responding to itself is the second concept is called, I, I call it the fold. So obviously, Meloponti and Bergson and tons of people and Lucretius talks about folds, ton and weaving and all this stuff. But I like this word fold because it, tr it tries to capture this idea that, that processes are not just processes in a vacuum, they're always relational. They respond to each other. They affect one another. But it's also a change in the whole that's changing itself. It's hard to describe, but it's a change in the whole, which is a relational change in the whole. So quantum uh, entanglement, this is one of the consequences of quantum entanglement. Everything in the universe is not only changing and moving, but it's also entangled. There's nothing that's not entangled to some degree. And at, so that's what I mean is things change and move in relation to each other. And when you have a fold, it produces or can produce a, a, pro, a cycle, um, some kind of metastability. Um, and let me just share the screen real quick and I'll give you the image. This image has helped me um, sort of think about what's going on um, in a kind of diagrammatic way. This is obviously not a literal representation of what goes on in the world. This is a diagram to help think about these concepts. And that is that the flow, that flows sort of, they flow, they swerve. And as they swerve, they, they move around and they can either affect themselves and transform themselves, or they can encounter other things and affect those. And they do that recursively, iteratively. So the more they keep doing it, the more they produce a metastable state. And that's what I'm calling the fold is a metastable state. And then of course, energy um, keeps flowing. It doesn't just stop, it flows through. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but it flows around the loop and then intersects or affects um, something and then flows out. And that's everything that, you know, that's everything that we can measure. Uh, that's everything from the Planck scale, which is the smallest theoretical unit of measurement every, all the way up is we're dealing with levels of metastability as energy is spreading out in the universe. Um, and then, so it, it creates, you know, we could say, I mean, all kinds of things, but you know, particles that vibrate back and forth, solids vibrate very slowly and very and in close, uh, uh, proximity to one another, liquids, gases, more so, uh, faster, more spread out. So all the stages of matter, um, and that was the importance of Einstein's, um, his, one of his first major papers was this, what he called the kinetic theory of matter. Uh, that matter, what we call matter, observable matter, is just the vibrations and frequencies of energy um, in a kind of metastable state. So then you have composites or aggregates, and this is the third concept, is fields. Uh, fields of circulation, 
Um, these are what those patterns are of, of the centripetal and centrifugal and so on. They are when you get a lot of, of these cycles cut together and they, they start to produce um, larger metastable aggregates. And so here, the diagram I've, I've drawn here is that the energy comes in, it cycles through, cycles through another, cycles through another, and these are connected and related to one another. And then they all are connected to one another. So the feet, so the, 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 the waste product or energy of one system is consumed by another and then consumed by another, and then ultimately sort of recycled again and again and again. So this is, I mean, this could be an image of a lot of things, but we could think of the earth we could think of earth systems in the same kind of way. And of course, of course, the earth is not an enclosed system perfectly. Uh, the earth leaks energy. Um, it absorbs energy from the sun, cycles through a bunch of systems, and then releases that energy out into space eventually after it's been broken down and so on. Okay. Um, so that's what, the, that's what the field is. There is, so those are the core concepts. Um, if you have questions, please ask me because I realize I've kind of moved quickly through a lot of, I don't know, maybe dense and kind of abstract sounding um, concepts. Uh, but there is one last one that I have to share with you, uh, a, a recent way to think about this because I was like, okay, well, if everything's flows and cycles and so on, uh, everything is moving and everything are these metastable states at every scale. Um, and I've tried to show this at every scale. Uh, obviously, I haven't because that's a really too big of a task to, to accomplish. But I've tried to show it um, at the cosmic level in theory of the Earth, at the planetary level, and then at the level of animals and organisms, and then uh, human politics, and then even human culture within human culture. So there's a kind of iterative uh, function of this. But anyway, this is, this is the last, uh, I, I promise, kind of conceptual consequence. These are not exactly new ideas, but they're a way to think about what we mean when we talk about the, the you know, some very large categories of ways of being, uh, which is quantity, quality, relation, and modality, uh, going back to some of Aristotle's and then Kant uses them. But um, quality, quantity, relation, and modality are different ways to think about process, different aspects or dimensions of what's going on in reality. Modality is, yeah, the way that something exists, the way that something is in the world. Uh, in this case, I'm saying that it's indeterminate. Uh, it's not a question of being or non-being, uh, but a question of indeterminacy or nature of indeterminacy. That's what the flows are. Um, and quality, when we think about what qualities are and the realm in art, when we talk about art, we're talking about things from a kind of qualitative, largely qualitative, although it doesn't have to be exclusively, qualitative dimension. We're thinking about the qualities, how those qualities relate to one another and hold together in a work of art. Those are what we're talking about in qualities are essentially points of affect, ways in which matter has touched itself and responded to itself and generated metastable things, uh, you know, um, in color, temperature, um, you know, texture. These are all results, qualitative uh, results of matter responding to itself. And then as those loop, those cycles go through, you can count the cycles of how, of how energy, how many times it vibrates back and forth and how many times, right? From, from one point to another point, back to the original point, you can count that and you can call it one. You don't have to call it one, but we play that game and we pretend to call it one. And that's what quantity is. Quantity is essentially a fold, a loop, but it just counts the loop and it can pretend, or it can at least just not not consider the qualitative aspect, or it can consider the qualitative aspect. We could say one, one pound of wheat, okay? Wheat is the quality, one pound is a unit of measure. It's, it's, it, it has to do with the, 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 some relationship or coordination between the, the weight of the wheat in relation to something else that's being weighed that we call a pound. Um, anyway, so science, uh, all the sciences, this includes technology, mathematics, anything that's quantitative is, is, is focusing on that aspect of reality. And it might include the others or it might not, um, but that's a dimension of reality that the, the loop or the fold explains how you would get something like the possibility of quantity that wasn't just a human construction. Um, that nature does this too. When it loops and coordinates its loops together, it has a quantitative dimension. It's not just a human abstraction, um, but it can also be, humans can abstract it. And then the final one is relation. Uh, relation I've put at the other arrow, which is where the loops connect with one another. Um, and in human, in human culture, we call this politics, which is to say how things are related to one another. Um, 
and these are these are the this is the, in the C, in the book series that I wrote. These are the these are the reasons why those books are on the way they are. Theory of the image was about the history and nature of art. Theory of the object was about science, uh, the history of science and quantity. Uh, and a figure of the migrant was about relations and politics, and then being in motion was about ontology. And all of this together, even though it's just a concept, it's not. I'm not saying it's, there's actually a totality, but this is what we call nature. And that's what the final book was about. Theory of the Earth was about how all of these things, quality, quantity, relation, modality, all are already there in the beginnings of the cosmos and the earth and nature. Um, and that's just what I'm calling it. You know, you could call it something else. I'm hesitant to call it God, but I'd say. I'm more comfortable calling it nature, um, but it just means all of these together. Okay, I think probably my time is almost up, so I'm just going to stop the share here and just probably better to have a conversation about, about some of this stuff. So that's the philosophy of motion. As, as, I'm, as, I've, as I've come to it, as I've tried to work through it, as I've tried to use it as a lens to uh, work through the big topics in human culture um, and to think about, uh, yeah, the, the nature of nature and then reread the history of philosophy through this lens of thinking about movement. Okay, I'll stop there. Thanks everybody for your, your patience. Thanks, Thomas. Um, great, so we'll give the floor now to everyone present to ask a question, comment, etc. We have already something in the uh, chat. Um, before that, before we answer the question in the chat, I wanted to, uh, to ask you to elaborate a little bit on the swerve and why is the swerve so central in uh, rendering the atomist theory or at least the variant of Epicurus and Lucretius and then its appropriation by uh, Marx, the only true materialism, according to you as you would put it. Uh, I, I think I, I heard you saying it. Um, that's, uh, we came to a similar conclusion with Greg Michelson and Paul Cockshot while working on our book on materialism and they are working on, you know, the scientific and mathematical uh, models of explanation. I'm working on philosophy, mainly Greek and Latin. So we kind of, agree with you and uh, also uh, about the centrality of the uh, notion of the swerve. Could you explain uh, why do you think the swerve is central in making this for attempt to establish materialism, you know, the only true or proper convincing form of materialism uh, without, you know, the remnants of uh, like in Aristotle's case, the, the prime mover, you know, he tried to conceive a, a theory of movement, but still kept mm, the possibility for the prime and movable mover there. Uh, this is different and it all relies on the notion of the swerve. Why is the swerve so important and what is the swerve? So Lucretius says that the swerve is so when matter flows, and he says, I mean, sometimes people interpret, and I think wrongly, because it's a counterfactual, he says, people imagine there's like a rain of atoms falling through a void, and then one of them swerves and like hits the others, and then the world is made. Um, that reading is just not in the text. I mean, when Lucretius says, he says, it's a counterfactual, he says, if, if the world was just like a rain of matter, um, then nothing would happen. Like that would, that there, there'd be no existence. And therefore, and he, the word he uses, the Latin word is solarant. So solarant means habitually, accustomed to, uh, in a habit of. He says matter is in the habit of, or is as sort of customarily always swerving. So this is really important. It's not just like matter swerves once in a while, is that matter is always swerving. Now that changes a lot what you mean by matter, because if matter is always swerve, now if it swerves once in a while, you assume that it's got a stable state and you could, that's a kind of substance ontology or metaphysics. Like, oh, it's got a substance, it's an atom. And then every now and then it swerves. It would still be weird, but it wouldn't be crazy. Uh, like really, really profound crazy. Like Lucretius is saying it is always swerving constantly. And so now like, what are you even talking about at that point? Where's the atom? No, the atom is gone. There's no atom anymore. Your substance is missing. 
Uh, you, there's, so there's no metaphysics of substance. There's no higher entity. It is just constant swerving. Now, of course, then the next questions you want to ask is, well, why is there a bunch of stuff in the world if everything's always swerving? And that's why I was trying to give this account. And this is why Lucretius gives this account of like, he says there the, all the flows of matter are swerving, but then they're woven together into a textile. And the text is filled with all these weaving things that are woven together and unwoven. Uh, but reality is woven together by flows of swerving matter. And to me, this is very, and I mean, I'm not sure I would say it was the only one true whatever, but I would say that like, with respect to what we currently know experimentally, um, everything else, I just, I'm agnostic about any metaphysical, anything. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But what I would say, just as an experimental historical point, this is what we know about quantum physics. This is what energy does, is it fluctuates indeterminately. And that word, I mean, that word, Rovelli, Carlo Rovelli, the Italian physicist, directly says, this is, Lucretius has a phrase he calls it in Latin, he says, incerto tempore, in certisque locis, which means indeterminate time, indeterminate space. Because where does the swerve happen? It doesn't happen like in a pre-given space-time. The swerve generates space-time. And that's a crazy idea. And that's a really radical idea that like virtually nobody accepts because there was not any, there was not scientific evidence to suggest that all the way up to contemporary quantum physics. So like, it's understandable that, that people in history would have a hard time with that. I think Engels had a hard time with that. I think Engels was one of the very few people that read Marx's dissertation and was like, yeah, but then he wrote Dialectics of Nature. And you're like, wait, did you read the dissertation? Because the dissertation is pretty clear that it's not deterministic. Everything is swerved. There's no swerve in Engels. Engels leaves out the swerve. And so he's able to give this kind of dialectic, progressive history of nature and then, of course, the Soviets pick up on all that stuff, too. And dialectical materialism is born and flourishes, but they're all missing the swerve. What would communism be with the swerve? Like that, to me, is a very interesting and provocative question. Um, and I think Marx always knew that the swerve was important. And I think Marxists do not read the dissertation enough. Or if they do, they do not take it seriously that there are no atoms, there are no particles. There's only matter swerving. And that's what Marx originally meant by dialectical materialism. He, and that's a crazy kind of... Uh, sorry, Ginger. Sorry. But, no, but he is in, explicit in the thesis that the swerve is the central thing in Lucretius, unlike uh, Democritus and the other atomist. Uh, I mean, Marx is not just indirectly on it, you know, it, he's like expressing it i think i remember the ex, uh, distinctly in the thesis so i mean this was just to support your argument sorry to interrupt you i'm just a little bit disgusted. no no it's great it's great i mean there's a, there is a much long yeah. that's the short yeah. story you're you yeah. probably know but there's a longer story to tell about marxists yeah. who have read the dissertation like all and you know other people there's a whole history of french and badu and deleuze and like there's a whole history of french philosophers Marxists reading that dissertation and coming to various conclusions. The thing is, none of them actually come to the conclusion that I just said. They come to really different conclusions from one another and all over the place. Badu's got this particle in the beginning story going on. None of them are seriously engaging the Latin text or the Latin language. Deleuze gets the closest, but then as I said, he really kind of fumbles it with this vitalism story, but that's just not in the text. And that's fine, whatever. Again, I'm not saying it's the one true whatever it's just all we have evidence for right now physically experimentally so i would say this is our best guess about how nature's working until we're wrong this is what i'm going to go with because it's very consistent with the story of quantum physics um in a non-interpretive sense like just agnostic experimentally what does quantum physics show us it shows us indeterminacy now then you can say however you want to explain that away but that's what a lot of quantum interpretation is doing it's just trying to explain away indeterminacy and Rovelli's book, actually, his latest book called um, Helgoland, is, it says exactly that. It's like the best, shortest little chapter where he's like, every interpretation of quantum physics is metaphysical and speculative. And here's why. The only one that's not is the indeterminate relational interpretation. And that's Rovelli's. He doesn't claim to be doing anything metaphysical or interpreting or explaining motion. He's just like, all these people are afraid of indeterminacy. Nobody will admit it. And I think this is like a, this is deep in the Western tradition. Everybody, art, science, politics, everybody, they just can't, they, it doesn't set well to say matter is indeterminate. It's just a process and there's no way to predict it ultimately.
And that I like Einstein was like, if that's true, like science is over. That was Einstein's like final throw down to bore. He was like, if you're right, science is over. And I don't want anything to do with it. God doesn't play dice. And he really thought he was going to he was going to get a classical interpretation in the end. And I think a lot of Marxists had the same aspirations. You know, I think Lenin wanted that. I think Engels wanted that. I think the Soviet they wanted explanations so they could get a dialectical story. Anyway, I'm going to stop rambling. Thank you. Good question. I look forward to talking more about Thanks. it later. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll ask you another one if there are not uh, many questions. There are. So first, uh, you had Hamis' uh, question. He's also enrolled in our course, by the way. He says, "Thanks a lot for your great talk. Your book, Theory of Border, you stress the movement of borders, change, flow, and circulation." And how they create the state, not vice versa. Can you elaborate on how borders make states? Can we also say that borders create and produce fixed static categories and identities such as refugees and migrants? Yes, absolutely, 100%. That is, that is I mean, those categories themselves, I, I think when you look at it historically, you see pretty clearly that. That the categories of migrant and refugee, they're, they're historical categories that emerge with states. Like you don't have refugees uh, and you don't have migrants uh, without states. Um, you, that, they're, that The terminology, the nomenclature, the whole political understanding is predicated on the existence of states. It's a reactionary category that's just defined in opposition. The longer story of how states emerge out of processes of bordering I can't possibly reproduce, but it is in theory of the border of just because there's because before there's states, it's not like there's no bordering either. It's not that borders are essentially state based. It's that there's just I mean, like, for example, fences. So fencing. Yeah. Early, you know, early prehistoric, like Neolithic humans, they totally had fences. They made houses. Right. They you know, they planted things like they made marks on the earth that that distinguished some things from other things. Um, and that was the beginnings of, of, of villages, of more settled or even quasi-settled human structures, is you start building fences um, and building houses. And you can come back to them. And then once you stay there full time, it starts to become consolidated and you can accumulate more and more and more. And then you get the explosion in the Neolithic and agriculture of like pottery. Pottery has got to be one of the most important technological inventions ever in human history. Like you never get off the ground without pottery and baskets, like really, really important. But those baskets, those are their little kinds of borders that, you know, they, they, they hold things in and they, and you keep them inside of a pen and you keep your animals in a pen and you keep your kids in a pen and you sit in your house and you store them and you distinguish that from your neighbors. Like that's the beginning of kind of early villages and you get the beginnings of social stratification. You get the beginnings of, of accumulation, the grain silo being the ultimate basket. It's a giant tower filled with grain that's there, well, for a million reasons, but that is, well, Lewis Mumford says, and I, I'm inclined to agree that like, and also um, James Scott Scott's book, Against the Grain is really lovely on this, like that consolidation of grain, that's the beginning of the state because somebody can control that grain and control the food supply and they can tax it and they can then administer out of a central tower based around this grain supply that you can accumulate. But if you never accumulate, there's the state doesn't really emerge unless there's accumulation. And accumulation requires a very specific structure of fencing and then even more uh, uh, fencing leading up to walls. Anyway, that's that That would be the beginnings of the state. Uh, certainly agree with uh, uh, James Scott's account and against the grain that it's about the centralization of of grain and then the control and manipulation and of, of power based on that food supply. And his counter examples are cu of cultures where people didn't grow grain. The state doesn't emerge. It's not that those people don't have any borders. It's that the never the borders never emerge into a like a, a border around centralized food stock. So it's a it's a qualitative change in how the borders work that generates the states. And then once the states exist, obviously, then they reproduce the borders that sustain them. And then the states, to the degree at which they dissolve those borders, they will start to dissolve as states, which is why the no borders political proposition sounds absolutely bonkers to anybody who's committed to the legacy of the nation state. They're like, how is that possible? Can't have no borders. Yeah, well, I mean, most of human history has had no state borders. It's a relatively recent invention. 
nothing. I mean, and borders aren't even that effective in preventing global movement. They're just really effective at killing people um, and wasting tons of money and criminalizing. Anyway, there's a million things to go off on borders. I'm going to stop there before I keep going. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Thomas. Uh, okay, uh, now uh, we keep receiving questions. Uh, sorry, we keep receiving questions in the chat on YouTube. Uh, that's why we always ask you to uh, register for a Zoom link so that we speak here because uh, I, I cannot, or anybody else, Vera or Adam or whoever might be chairing, we cannot follow uh, the channel on uh, YouTube. So, but. Zach saw a couple of questions there. Uh, so first we will read out the questions posed here in the Zoom chat. And then Zach, the questions you found on the stream or the one you sent me that you thought it was worthwhile responding, you can read it out, okay? So yep. you take the YouTube questions if there is plural and I'll read the, the Zoom questions, okay. Uh, Davar's question, Davar Lofler. Um, one question, please. For example, with the loop, are you not looking for or producing a static concept to frame the flow and its principles again? So is such a philosophy of motion not itself an attempt to produce stability, something static? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it is a paradoxical attempt to produce something metastable. I mean, again, there's nothing static in the universe, so I'm not trying to make anything static. Um, I would say that like, yeah, the diagram, it's kind of limited by the fact that it's, it's, it's the kind of, it's not moving. Um, so I'm actually working with somebody now to like help make a diagram that's sort of animated. I'm not sure if that would solve your concern. Because you might say, well, just if you have a concept of motion, that's automatically static. I mean, it's not automatically static. Like I'm a person saying things, moving around. So are you. There just is no stasis. Um, I, what I would say is the concept of motion, whatever that is going to mean, is a real living performative thing that I have to do, you have to hear, you have to agree with or disagree with or whatever. But it has to be hashed out. And in that sense, I don't think that it's not. I don't think it's static. And certainly, as I said before, my philosophical position is that everything is in motion. It's an empirical claim, not a metaphysical one. So like, I'm not trying to make anything static. I'm just saying, we keep looking, we keep finding, everything is in movement. Let me know when you find something static. And then I will, I will say, oh yeah, I was wrong. I thought it was X, it's actually not. That's, not. that's not a static way of thinking about things. That's an open way of being able to be proved wrong about a fundamental starting point. Um, I'm complete, like, like I said, the philosophy is very empirical. It's very historical. Everything I'm describing is about things that are really moving um, and they could change. It could be otherwise, but until then I'm going to go with the philosophy of movement um, un until we find something static and then everything else will just be metastable, including my concepts and my little diagrams and whatever attempts I have to like say and talk about stuff. I kind of have to do that. I mean, I don't know if there's another way to not say words and draw pictures to try to explain an idea but you could say that attempt itself is some attempt to capture or whatever i would that's you could read it that way but that's not how i think about what concepts are i think of concepts as real active things out there that have real affects and they're transformative people agree and disagree and they kind of sink in or they never sink in or whatever they have a life of their own they're not they're not mine um and so yeah that's that's what i would say about that Okay, uh, Davar is responding in the chat area asking, okay, is the triangle triangle uh, also moving them? The triangle or the? The triangle, yes. Which one was the triangle? The geometrical figure. Oh, just in general, is a triangle moving? Yeah, what would you say? Okay. Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, like, what do you, I mean, how is it not moving? Like, if you look at the triangle, what do we, first of all, is it an idea of a triangle? In which case, obviously your brain is totally moving around when you're thinking of a triangle. Are you talking about a triangle that you drew on a piece of paper? Then yes, obviously the, the triangle is totally composed of matter, which is vibrating and moving. I mean, I, I can't think of a single instance. Like now, if you're saying, if it's, if, if you mean, and this is of course, some people have this idea and this is Plato's idea that when you think of a triangle, 
you're having a pure concept which is detached from the material world that is all triangles and none of them at the same time somehow and that's what it means and that that you are accessing an idea that's outside of space and time if that is what you're getting out of the triangle i would say i there is no evidence to suggest that there is a triangle outside of space and time let me know when you can provide some evidence i'm happy to change my mind on this but until you give me any evidence of a triangle outside of space and time or frankly anything outside of space and time I'm just going to remain agnostic about that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Somebody's quoting Heraclitus uh, in changing addresses. Uh, okay, Zach, can you read the question from the stream? Or should I? Yeah, I can read it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a general question. So it's, but it just says, uh, yes, this was so interesting. Do you have any examples of how this philosophy of movement can be applied to something concrete, like a political issue, which I guess you kind of covered in some part already, but. Um, yeah, I could really go on for way too long. Yeah. Um, so that's what, that's what figure the migrant and theory of the border yeah. uh, together about 600 pages of text or that's all, that's the whole goal. Um, I also write like, constantly about politics and capitalism and COVID and Marxism. So like, without even getting into the technical details of the philosophy of movement stuff, uh, climate change, like I've just, yeah, I mean, so theory of the year, all, all I can say is I just, good question. I direct, I direct the interested uh, questioner to um, like a lot of stuff that I've written. Almost all of it is practical in its connotation. I've answered this in a kind of a very general way as like an introduction to what the philosophy movement is. I've talked a little bit about some of the consequences, but there's like, to me, the vast majority, like 99% of the work is like looking at the concrete consequences. And then there's a little bit in the beginning that is like the introduction to get you started on the framework from which a lot of those things would follow as, as consequences or at least different ways of thinking about what's going on. Um, yeah, sorry, but my mind is just reeling with too many possible concrete consequences. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, written like 10 books just on, on that, so. Yeah, thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, there is another question. Uh, or you can all raise hands and uh, ask, I mean, the virtual hands or the real ones wave to me or turn on your mic. Uh, uh, but okay, they keep coming in the chat area. So uh, every I am there to everyone, uh, I guess to you, uh, how do you think is the principle of identity A is A? So, Ontology, uh, possible? Is, uh, this yeah. is what you're asking. Yeah, okay. How is the, how do you think is the principle of identity? Oh yeah, okay, um, it's not, it's not possible. <laughs> uh, it's not possible. Uh, there's just, there is no identity in the universe. Um, I guess I would ask, why do you think identity is a real thing? I know that's, I'm giving a kind of cheeky answer, but I will, let me give you the, the technical, answer what is identity when we talk about it like what are we doing when we talk about identity what we are doing is we are we're essentially identifying a medicine we are metastable entities identifying another stable metastable entity and then we call it an entity and when we do that we we move our brains we move our mouths we move our bodies and that thing keeps moving too and then we call it identity now, whether it's if you're just talking about an idea in your head, you're 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 dealing with a metastable relation of neurons firing in the brain at a, in a certain pattern over and over again, and then you call that identity. But it's not there's nothing really identical happening in that those brain frequencies. Again, if you find it, let neuroscientists know because they have they cannot find anything like that in the brain. There is just neural activity, ninety five percent of it, which is they call spontaneous fluctuations. Nobody knows exactly what it's doing, but there's certainly nothing like identity going on in the brain. And there's nothing like identity going on in the world. But the answer is like the whirlpool case. We look at the world and we see like, oh, look, there's a chair. It's like a whirlpool in that way. Well, what you're seeing is energy that is going into that chair, moving around in the chair and then leaving that chair. Uh, you can't see the energy radiating off of that chair, but I promise there is radi energy radiating off of that chair. So what looks to be very static, what looks to be very stable or identical to itself, it's just, you know, it's just a name. It's just a relative degree of metastability that we're going to call that just as a practical exercise. 
let's call that a chair. Okay, now we can get along with our lives and eat food and sit down and all that business. I mean, it can be quite overwhelming to think everything as a process and live like it's a process. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a different way to live that um, because practically we just yeah have an instrumental orientation to the world and identity functions, but it's, it's just that. It's a story. It's a practical thing that we do. We filter out the vast majority of, of sensory information coming into our brains and bodies and we get about that much of it and then we extrapolate like crazy about it and we're often wrong. And then that is, <laughs> that's the history of human existence is extrapolating and being wrong about lots of things and trying to figure out how far you can extrapolate uh, and filter things out and still be kind of right enough to do what you want. Um, but it's all kind of a game of make-believe really. I mean, nature is not, we don't really have any evidence that that's really how things are. Sorry, that's the longer answer to take that seriously. The short answer is just identity is not possible. It's not a thing. Um, okay, uh, we have, uh, we should be moving on because there are many questions. Charlie Blake, uh, thanks Charlie, you asked my second question, the one I intended to ask in case there was time. Uh, it's about the void. So uh, he says, uh, thanks for the fa fabulous talk. Just taking you back to your observation on the puzzling investment, so many thinkers have stasis and noted that if they looked around, they'd realize nothing is static, that's what you said. So if you spin that statement positively, what might the status be of nothing in your theory of motion? Daring, I think he's hinting to the void uh, uh, enveloped by matter. I, is that right, Joy? Uh, bearing in mind, uh, the role of the void in the background, Democritus on, and Bergson's view that nothing is pseudo is a pseudo problem, a position that Blues kind of concurs with in his own way too. Is there a role for the void in your thinking and put the concept of the void or non-concept of something to do with the will to stasis? Yeah, yeah, this is a great question um, because it, it appears, you know, there's a, there's a word, there's a Latin word for it in in Lucretius's text. He engages with this tradition. Um, I I am on I'm on the side of Bergson and Deleuze on this that nothing is just it's like a pseudo problem. Actually, a st a st I was in class the other day and a student asked this very similar question about like, well, what is nothing? And then I just like, and I just stopped, and then we all laughed because it was just clear at that point that this is this is a sort of pseudo problem of thinking about nothingness. Um, but here's the answer from the, the, the Lucretian side of things. The way that Lucretius describes what the void is, and Deleuze's reading of it, I think, is just really right on uh, on this point, uh, is that, and it's consistent with the text because there's another whole image in Lucretius about pores. He says that matter is sort of porous. Um, and he doesn't mean that in any kind of like ontological sense, but that the way matter moves. So in the diagram, I have these loops. Um, and in Lucretius, these loops uh, they're looping around and in between and inside there, there's a relative, you know, that's that's where the, the matter is looping around. But inside of that, you have more loops. So there's always loops inside loops inside loops. There's never like, oh, here's a pure flow and here's a pure loop. The, the loops are just, they're knotted all the way down. And that's why Lucretius says everything is porous. And that's why things move around in the loops of other things. So he says that's where things move is they move uh, in the area made by other things. Now, let me, so that's, that's an answer, a technical answer. The Latin word there is a non-a that has much to do with the, uh, with the sort of ancient idea of space. We, when we talk about space, we tend to think about it as like empty space and this car, but it's a Cartesian idea. Originally, you know, for the, for, for in the ancient world, for the Greeks and for the Romans, space was never this like empty thing. Space was like, so when you, th when we read the void now, we're like, oh, the void, we think of like Newton and Descartes, we think of like modern science void. Um, or vacuum or something like that. But when you look at the ancients, none of them had that idea of what empty, but what empty like space was or void was. Void was always um, was always full, and it was always doing something. So there's a lot of uh, wonderful Greek words like kora um, to indicate this idea that space is active and formative, and in that space, other things happen. So think about this as a kind of alteration or multiplicity in which a space is made by matter that then other matter works inside that space. And then other matter inside of the space made by that thing. 
I mean, this is maybe, uh, let, let me give you the physics answer in addition to this historical uh, and textual answer. The physics answer is that space itself is wove, like what we call space time is something that's woven out of energy. So space time has energy. And then things happen in space time, like us. And then things happen inside of our bodies, like bacteria. And then things happen inside bacteria, right? Like mitochondria or whatever. Like ev all the way down, spaces are living with inside spaces. So there's never an absolute space. The tendency to, to meta make metaphysical the idea of the void, I think that's a, that's a modern kind of consequence that moderns interpreted Lucretius and Epicurus as talking about a sheer emptiness in a Cartesian way. But I don't think Epicurus or Democritus or Lucretius ever thought about the void as like ultimately empty. They were thinking about it. If you think about their context, their context is the archaic Greek tradition coming out of people like Hesiod and Homer and the Homeric poets, where space is not empty at all. There's no empty space in Homer. There's no empty space in Hesiod. There's, there's, for Hesiod, there's chaos in the beginning. It's a generative emptiness. And that is what the quantum vacuum is for. And Karen Barad has a, a passage where she talks about this in her book um, on meeting the universe. And I actually, an article too, that's like one of my favorite of hers, where she talks about the void and it kind of compares historical ways of thinking about the void. And the, the conclusion of quantum physics is the void is positive and creative. And that's the same thing in Lucretius as well. There's a kind of alternation of spaces, but all the way down, you get matter being active, opening up pores for other things to happen inside of, inside of those and so on. Thanks. But yeah, it's a good question. But, uh, but let me intervene only briefly. Let's not forget that what Homer used to say, the Eleatic spoiled. So, you know, movement was impossible because, uh, you know, nothing comes from nothing. So it's just being, there is no, uh, no uh, non-being or nothingness in any way. And it's fully ontologized, therefore, epistemologically uh, thought was uh, uh, philosophical thinking until the atomists and what Aristotle did with the atomists, uh, the atomists, uh, the, uh, the possibility of thinking motion was almost, the, uh, the possibility was impossible. Yeah, it was almost impossible <laughs> to, to think motion. Uh, and it's really the atomist contribution and uh, what Aristotle did with them how he used them methodologically but yes you're right in the end he ends up with the unmovable mover after all but he did kind of a good job after all yeah he did. <laughs> uh okay uh you have uh, compliments from helen palmer it was fantastic she looked uh, forward uh, to hear more on Wolf and Lucretius, Rick Elmore has to go. Uh, this was oh, wait, wonderful. Can I jump in, Katerina, really quick? So it, there's somebody in the room, Christopher, that has a, a question, has yeah, their hand no, up. I just want to oh, okay. read oh, okay. uh, thank you, uh, comment, and then I'll... Oh, and yeah. Rick, Rick has a hand up, yeah. too. Uh, and it's wonderful to see you. Thanks for making this lecture possible. Okay. Uh, oh. Sorry, this was uh, direct to me. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. <laughs> it wasn't a question to you. It was a, to me. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. It was a thank you to me. But it was also a compliment to you. Uh, oh, I see. I no, I got the, I got the direct message though, received, as well. I received it as a direct message. Never mind. I... Okay, people don't direct message me. I keep thinking there for everybody. And then... <laughs> okay, Christopher, go ahead. Hi, yeah, firstly, what an awesome lecture and an awesome research program. I will look forward to seeing more lectures in the near future in the October series. My question is, and maybe you gestured towards it a little bit. Um, do you have any opinion any normative opinions on the uptake of your theory? I mean, I'm sure you do with, with what you mentioned in all your books and they're very engaged with politics and, and culture, but in terms of theoretically, I, this question arises for me because you mentioned, as you mentioned, the instrumental view is very useful for us and we need to take certain stances, pragmatic maybe, um, or instrumental to get by. And the way you were speaking also reminded me of the fictionalist camp whereby we take on, well, we have these sort of beliefs that aren't aimed at truth, 
we take away truth from the occasion or the equation right rather and we reorient ourselves towards usefulness or in the pragmatics or we reorient ourselves towards some condition success or um it does a satisfying job something like this and i was just wondering um where you stand on the uptake if you have a normative opinion on on this anyway to rephrase yeah thanks that's a great that's a great question i appreciate that um yeah i would say that i mean i i don't have a normative in like a big grand norm like capital n normative metaphysical sense of of what to do um only just a kind of maybe a i don't know i'm maybe a, a meta ethical point or like a meta practical point um and not so much a practical normative position but the th i think the thing that's important in all of this kind of like usefulness practicalness like pragmatism like uh, i'm not, that's not the position that i have but it's not totally different than that like you're right to suggest that that sounds like where this might go but the qualification is a tentative idea of how reality is working and that's not based on metaphysics but that's based on physics like that based on experimental lived keeping track of what how things are working and what's going on so that's a kind of provisional historical ontology coupled with a pragmatism that's not like i think useful is such a problematic term but like just experimental i like that term or improvisational i like that term better than useful um only because it's never obvious what is useful uh, you know like beforehand it's like you have to try and you that's like i don't know my problem with utilitarianism it's just like how do you even know what's useful to you like you're not even the person who you are and you're going to change and the world is changing like it's just not obvious to me that you're going to get like useful is like any it offers any explanation like it's just it offers nothing but it pretends like it does so i think improvisation and experiment is really what we have um but all of that is on the kind of meta ethical point that like nature is process as far as we know and that that is something to remember and not forget why because your practices are likely not necessarily but they're likely to get screwed up you're likely to make some big errors in judgment if you think that the world is static and that it's made of particles and that the earth is stable or and that the climate is fixed and we can't mess it up like if you think that like historically the western tradition has then it's not just experimental it's like you if you're just like who cares what reality actually is let's just do useful things you're already working with an assumption about reality like you can't get away from that assumption about what we know about does that make sense like you're working with something and i would say it's really important to be working with something not that it's absolute but that you start from some place and then you see how you can experiment under that under that assumption and that's what i so i think you need those dial some kind of dialectic between experimenting and improv improvising and remembering that you're dealing with process or else you're going to end up possibly with just absolute ecological destruction because you're like, oh, it was useful to just totally deforest that area. And then it's like, yeah, you unleash SARS and COVID and malaria. Oh, it turns out that was a really bad decision. Well, you would have known if you had thought about what ecological processes are. If you thought about Earth systems as processes and the whole Earth as like a bunch of processes, you'd be a lot more careful before deforesting an entire area. Maybe. I mean, maybe you wouldn't give a shit. Maybe you're just an asshole. I don't know. I'm not saying you wouldn't necessarily follow, but it's a pretty good guide. Like, it's probably if you want to survive, that's the meta ethical point to practice and improvise, then you have to be alive to do all that stuff. And just like if you were walking across like a tightrope, it's better to not have a blindfold on uh, to get where you're going. You know, you don't have to. I mean, by all means, put on a blindfold, but you're more likely to fall off with a blindfold on. Um, and that's what pure pragmatism without any source of engagement with what reality is going on in reality like just pure social constructivist utilitarian pragmatism if that's what we mean it's going to be devastating i mean whatever you could choose it you could not choose it nature doesn't care one way or the other but you're probably going to die um you're going to risk your life and endanger yourself and you won't be able to do your useful pragmatic whatevers if you destroy things if you don't realize that they're processes so again it's not a hard norm but it's like a norm a tentative norm for experimentation that I think is more like, I don't know, it's more likely to help you than it is to hurt you. But if you don't want to be helped, by all means, human civilization, please kill yourselves and generate capitalism as a cancer on the planet and destroy. I mean, like, that's basically where we're at is just totally self absorbed capitalist pragmatism um, without any caring about what's actually going on. Um, 
or yeah, just not engaging with it. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop there, but it's a good, it's a good question. And theory of the earth is where I talk a lot about that toward the end, the last couple chapters. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Christopher. Okay. Thanks. So our time is basically up, but the questions keep coming in. Uh, so the media was kiss to everybody. Uh, should I read this question and take another question, Thomas, and then we end? Yes, okay. I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay. So, uh, Media Vasquez, uh, thank you for the talk. I wonder if you're familiar with the theory of relative locality, which, uh, in a sense, undoes the need of space time altogether and deals with energy momentum phase spaces. Also, what happens to the movement of thought? Is this something you consider in your work? Um, yeah, so the, the relative locality, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what, is that referring to general relativity? Um, I don't know, I mean, if it just- yeah, why, why don't you join the discussion so that you can explain what you mean? It do, undoes the need of space-time altogether. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's um, it's just a theoretical position that um, okay. uh, it's 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 an attempt to basically um, I send the paper in the link that you can read. A oh, bit, thank uh, you, thank yeah. you. Uh, it's it's still I mean it's a theoretical sort of phys physical position, but to me it sounds like this could be something that I mean I think one of the problems with talking about movement is because it's a coagulation of space-time that people sometimes struggle with that idea but what if we just drop completely the concept of space-time which anyway mm. is mm. problematic when we speak about motion uh, w then we can w speak about at the level of er en energy and uh, momentum for example um, this also i think w the reason i'm thinking about the movement of thought is because i was thinking about Deleuze the way that i think the way he writes has something to do with the, the movement of thinking itself as a process. Um, so, so that's why, I, to me, I consider him a, he's a thinker of, of movement uh, already because of the differential. Just, so just like the difference itself already coagulates space-time in motion. So there's never like something static because you're starting from differential. So that, to me, that means immediately this is motion, but also uh, the way he writes, it, it, the movement is implemented within the writing itself, whether it's dialectic or the zigzagging, or, or I think there's something happening also in the way that, you know, the exercise is done, that what it does to the thinker or to the reader. Uh, so, yeah, those are the two. Yeah, thanks. Those are, those are both great questions. I understand now where you're coming from. And to the first one, I would say definitely, like, thanks for the paper. I'll read it. The other, the other, um, the other place where I've read an interesting theory that that to me I'm sort of actually more sympathetic for on the question of uh, of, of quantum gravity than than Rovelli's answer, even though I like a lot where Rovelli's coming from theoretically. Um, his 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 quantum gravity theory, uh, I sort of like. Um, there's another one that's very recent in the in the past few years, but um, it's entropy and entanglement. So just with the equations of in, of 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 entropy and entanglement without starting with space-time, you can get a theory which is actually very consistent both with the equations of general relativity um, and, you know, well, so basically space-time. So, but you don't have to start with space-time. So you can, like Rovelli, that's the thing is Rovelli starts with space-time and tries to give a quantum interpretation of it, but you could alternately start with just energy and think about entropy, the entropy of that energy as spreading out and as it spreads out, it changes the, you could look at the ratios of the, the level of entanglement as things become more spread out. So just with the concept of entangled energy, without assuming any space time, you can get a, a fully functional theory that's consistent with general relativity, and that would bring those things together. So that's actually kind of my running favorite theory. Again, we're waiting for experimental evidence on any of this, but I like that one. I think it's more consistent with Lucretius then starting with space time and trying to give a quantum explanation, you start with quant the quantum realm and then work your way up to space time if you want to get the equations of space time. Or you can just, yeah, as you say, like maybe this paper is like saying, we don't even need to have space time as an explanation at all. Why not just stick the level of energy um, and you just have an energetic exp explanation? Thank you for the paper. I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that view.
Um, the thing on Deleuze, I do like difference in repetition uh, in part because it's one of the least vitalist texts. Um, there's still a little bit in there, but he, he, he gets more, he starts, especially the language of forces starts to become quite strong um, it starting in difference of repetition. And to me, I'm with you on this movement of thought and so on. But I also have to say that in difference repetition, uh, in the section on the syntheses of time, he's very clear that the, 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 the third, synthesis, third synthesis is static. He says the third synthesis is totally static. Um, and to me, that's, I just can't go that, that path. Deleuze often talks about stasis. Um, he talks a lot about motion. I'm with you. I was there. And now I hunted down all the passages where he talked about stasis and the passages in difference repetition, where he explicitly says that Whitehead's book, um, Process and Reality, is like one of the best books of, of, of philosophy. He says that in difference repetition because he's kind of merging together um, uh, Bergson and Whitehead. He wants to have like the ultimate process philosophy. But he gets it in a very weird way because the two previous process, major process philosophers were Whitehead and Bergson. And he puts them together and then he ends up with this very weird, he's talking often about motion from Bergson, but then he often talks often about stasis, which is what Whitehead says ultimately. Whitehead is very clear. This is a direct quote. There is no movement. That's Whitehead. Whitehead is very clear that there's no movement, no change. Nothing changes, nothing moves. It's like a strobe light. It's called occasionalism. It's just that the world strobes um, and, Ber and Deleuze is always going back and forth. That's why I think he's so confusing. And I think that's why he draws Whitehead and Bergson and the people who like Whitehead and Bergson together. But really those are very different thinkers um, on what the nature of process is. So I'd say ultimately, yes, I like the movement of thought. Of course, thought is in motion and all that stuff, but I'm not really sure that ultimately that's where, where Deleuze is gonna land because he has this idea of stasis and the third synthesis and stasis throughout the other texts even when he talks about motion, he wants motion and stasis. And I just think that there's no evidence for stasis. Really, we just have motion. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks, awesome questions. Okay, is there another one final question before we go? Either raise your hand or turn on the mic, so. And if, okay, Alex, go ahead, please. Oh, I think he muted. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Dr. Nail, thank you so much for a lovely and, and fascinating talk and so stimulating in so many different dimensions. It's a kind of a philosophical question about, about stasis and change. So sometimes I think that we can't make sense of the concept of change unless there's an underlying substrate that stays the same. What, you know, to that kind of move that, you know, is, you know, happens sometimes, what, what, what is your thought? Yeah, this is a great question. And this is why, I mean, I, maybe the Whitehead thing sparked you on this because that's Whitehead's problem too. He's like, look, there's no change because change assumes a substance that's changing. I agree with that but I have a different solution than Whitehead does. Okay, here's Whitehead's solution, is that instead of a substance that's changing, there is like a strobe effect, the entire cosmos comes into existence and then disappears. And then another one comes right after that, that's very similar, but slightly different. And then run together, it's like a film strip. And Bergson is like, no, 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 Bergson hates that idea. Whitehead, that's just what Cambridge change was for Russell and a bunch of those other English philosophers thinking about change. They had the same kind of question. So. There's two answers and then I'll give you mine. The Whiteheadian answer is there is no underlying substance because everything flashes constantly in a series. And so nothing changes and nothing moves, just everything pops into existence and falls out again. Bergson's answer is that everything changes and it's not a substance because it's a vital energy. Not a substance that doesn't change, the vital energy itself is the source of change, but is itself not a substance. It's a weird idea. It's basically, in my reading, a metaphysical idea, like nobody's ever seen a vital force. Like, I don't know what the hell that is, not a real thing, um, but it's, an, it's a metaphysical explanation that explains why things change and move. My explanation is the one that is consistent with the, it, the interpretation of quantum physics that I'm giving is that you're not dealing with a substance. When we, you're right, when we say change, we often mean change on a substance, but that, that's what that background space-time is. For, a, I mean, the vast majority of like 
theoretical physics, they're dealing with this background space time, unless they're dealing with quantum gravity, they're assuming that background space time and then things change on the background. Um, but the problem is if energy is producing that space time and the energy is constantly changing and fluctuating, then there just is Marx calls it, and Marx deals with this too in the dissertation. He calls it absolute movement, the change of change and the change of change. That's, that's why I'm on that kind of that's, and that's the incerto tempore. That's the Lucretius and Marx position. And that's where I would land is that change does not mean change of a substance. And that's all. I mean, Heraclitus is that too, that there was somebody put that in the thing, like change means that something stays rest. Heraclitus was a monist. Everything's made of fire. Yeah. Change, everything changes, but fire, fire, right? Fire is the thing that's doing all the changing. But for me, the energy, like what I'm calling matter and movement, it's just the cha constant change of change. There's no substance. There's just pure change. And that's what I mean by movement is pure indeterminate transformation. Yeah. But it generates metastable states. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, with that, no vital forces, no strobe effects, you can just say pure absolute movement, constant transformation that generates metastable you know, states. Anyway, yeah, thank you, Alex, great question. Okay, so if there isn't any final comment, we may close this session. Before that, let me uh, tell you all, some of you are enrolled, some of the, you might be watching online and, uh, and are already enrolled. Uh, Thomas and I are going to teach a course on more or less these questions discussed in this session. So those that are enrolled, please do really attend the classes <laughs> because it's usually like 20, 30 and then only 10 ca ca uh, show up. So uh, this uh, consider this a teasers. And uh, this was a, an animated, interesting discussion. It will be as fun as this much. Uh, so come to the uh, classes as well in the intensive study program. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Thomas, a lot. I think that everybody enjoyed it quite a lot. Uh, we had a really lively discussion and there were so many uh, questions. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And I'll see yeah, you Yeah, thank you. Yeah, soon, thanks for inviting me. Awesome questions. Uh, okay, thanks a lot. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, um, Bye. thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.